it's impossible. Okay, <laughs> here we are. We're uh, we're ruminating about uh, what's going, what teaching with all kinds of electronic possibilities. Um, last time, if you remember, let's go to the PowerPoint. We were talking about Erickson's eight stages, and we <coughs> we compared them. Uh, we saw that the ages, here are the ages of the stages, wait. We compared them to uh, Freud stages, the first five to Freud stages, and showed how there was a social component to each one. Then we went, we showed how there were, he had put additional adult stages. And then finally we taught, the ages of course are fairly comparable to Freud's up to here, and then of course he has his three adult stages. And we had talked about the socially significant others at each stage, and we had gotten to initiative versus guilt. Okay? Um, and we said that at initiative versus guilt, this was the why, why, why stage. This was trying to figure out how to do things yourself. By the way, this is the stage autonomy versus shame, no, 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 of the terrible twos. Temper tantrums, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, trying to do everything myself, even when you can't. Here, first of all, there comes an ability to do those things. Kids can really put on their more or less dress themselves by themselves, and they can turn on the lights, and they can get in and out of the car, or whatever else has to be done. And here comes the experimenting, trying to see how things work, how well things go. And remember. This is about three to six. And here we get industry versus inferiority. This is similar to Freud's latency stage, okay, which is, I wish this computer could go stretch wide, 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 so we could have this all next to each other, which is, whoops, sorry, which is um, approximately six to 12. And if you remember, that's school age, okay? So, at this stage, we're going to, here is the point at which Freud tells us, industry versus inferiority, that we're away from the family, we're in with peers, the neighborhood and others, and school, going to school. If you remember, come back to, come back to me if you can now, Freud said that the latency stage was the time when children, when children began to, uh, Sex, psychosexual energy went down and children began to acquire the skills necessary in society and he wasn't terribly interested in it. First of all, he thought personality was by and large formed in the Oedipal stage. Uh, and then he also was very interested in all the, he and the Freudians after him, in all the tremendous emotional uh, uh, energy that comes in in the genital stage when many of these um, tendencies from the Oedipal stage manifest themselves, right? This is a place where, uh, um, you know, we have this tr tr try to get tremendous resolution of our adult sexuality. And, but for him, this, this stage was eh. He didn't care too much. I remember I told you about Summerhill in which he said, look, the main thing to remember about this stage is that it's, uh, right, in Summerhill the idea was if you have mental health, then you'll be fine. Then you'll be fine and you'll learn what you need to know. But that's not true for Erickson. Erickson understood that acquiring the necessary skills to, to become a functioning member of society and to feel that you have the skills that are necessary is extremely important. Now, obviously, this is going to be extremely difficult if you have, let's go back to PowerPoint for one second, if you have a sense of guilt about everything you try, if you're afraid to fail because you'll be shamed or you feel, or you feel that what you're doing is bad, right? Don't do that. You broke the lamp. You broke this. You tried that. You didn't do it. It's no good, okay? That it's bad. It's no good. It's going to be hard to get a sense of industry, right? And so, but Erickson said that the crucial people, again, once more, are the school is the crucial social, uh, 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 social relationship that the child has during this stage. Okay, come back to me if you can. Okay, he's basically telling you the same thing that, that Ben Dora told us with self-efficacy and that Piaget told us with competence. 
Okay, he's going to tell you the same thing all over again. We're going to see it again with, with uh, Maslow in a slightly different way. Okay, people function well when they have a sense, a good sense about themselves. Okay, look, no matter where people come from, they come from radically different theoretical perspectives. These were people who were good scientists. They really didn't have political access to grind. Uh, the way we often do today, okay? So, in science, um, so, um, they observed, and they all saw the same thing. They all saw the same thing. People with a good sense of themselves, the sense of a sense of a good self-efficacy, a sense of competence, or a sense of industry versus a sense of inferiority functioned well. Those who didn't have that sense didn't. Okay? Industry means a sense that when I undertake a task, I can achieve it. A sense of inferiority is I can't do this. I, I can't do it. I'm going to tell you a story, and I, I could tell it any one of these things. I'm going to tell you a story about, um, I told you about my son and Stephen, didn't I? When a, they had the fight at the mall, became his friend. Didn't I tell you that story? Maybe. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, my, my, friend had a, uh, my son had a good friend, his name was Stephen, who went to public school. I'll tell it again briefly. They met at a, I told you about playing basketball, about expectations. Stephen was a tall black kid, right? And my son was so much better, but everybody, okay. Anyway, one day, I'm, I, I used to wrestle with my son, okay? And this is my oldest one. He's a very good athlete still, a very good athlete, okay? And so we'd wrestle, and he was a much better at any physical thing than I was. But when we would wrestle, I had one slight advantage over him. I outweighed him by... 100 pounds, something like that, right? We'd wrestle on the couch, right, to be sure. And it was fun, and I would try to get him and pin him down, and he'd do something, he'd pull a hair, or he'd pinch me, and I could get out, right? But I had one hold, I would, but one day I'm on him, and I got on him, and I called that the blubber hold, right? I'm on him with a blubber hold. And he couldn't get out, couldn't get out. So I said, all you have to do for me to let you go is say blubber is king and I'll let you go. No, no, I'm gonna, he was a fiercely competitive. That's another reason he's a good athlete. Finally, I've got him and I, actually he got very frustrated and annoyed and he said to me, get off me you stupid sped. <laughs> so I jumped up. I said, what's a sped? So he said, wait, don't give it away yet. She said, I don't know, it means a dummy. I said, what do you mean, a dummy? So where does it come from? He said, it doesn't come from it, just a word. The only place I can think that he learned that word was from Stephen. Sped means, push it down, push it down. Special ed. Special ed, right, special ed. At that time, the school he went to, there was no special ed classes. He went to a parochial school, private parochial school. There were no special ed classes. It was a word that was around. So we label kids speds, of course it's special ed, for, you for, for their own good, really, really? He had no idea what it meant. Of course the kids in the public school who were called speds, they knew darn well what it meant. Stupid sped, right? That's the only place I could figure, I asked him if he learned it from Steve, he said, I don't remember, it's just a word, right? So that becomes the problem with labels and labeling kids and what's wrong with you. It's easy to give kids a sense of inferiority about things. Okay. Oh, look, who, oh, look for a change, so-and-so is finally in line on time. Talk about a slap at the kid, you know. Gee, what a miracle, you're doing something right. 
You cannot do that. Right? Everyone, okay, who's ever been in the school systems knows darn well that kids learn at different rates and speeds. How smart do you have to be to figure that out? How much do you have to look to see that it's true? That some kids are ready to learn certain things and some kids are not. But we say, no, 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 no. We can speed everybody up. So we're going to give everybody the same test on the same day. The anxiety about the tax tests, the anxiety about all the other tests, that anxiety, that anxiety says Erickson, is less about, oh, whether I pass or fail this test, then what does it say about me? Huh? I've already told you that the new IQ test, the people who put out these tests themselves, say that the total score doesn't mean anything. Right? That's something everyone else has known since the test came out. But finally, finally, under this constant attack, they've said, OK, we're just going to look at subtests. But if I tell you that your IQ is 80, it's going to bother you, even though it doesn't mean anything. I cannot explain to you the ambivalent, ambivalent feelings that I have. When I took the GRE, okay, that's the test to get into graduate school. It's like the SAT, but for graduate school. I did pretty well on the math section. My math is eh, but I'm a very good test taker. And I had strategies that I knew to figure it out. I had a hard time. After, when I took the test, I was having trouble with the statistics course that I was taking. I was taking a statistics course at the time. That's, this I took to get into, I, I did my master's degree in Israel, so I didn't have to take the test. But to do my doctorate, I was coming back to the US to do my doctorate, uh, I was in the middle of a statistics course. And it just, so on the one hand, I knew that the score did not reflect my abilities in this area. On the other hand, it made me feel good. Look how well I did on this test, right? Why? I knew the test didn't, wasn't reflective because this test has become a measure of how good you are. And the most, in, the most damaging thing that a school can do to a kid from the point of view of emotional health and even from the point of view of learning, says Ben Dor, point of view of emotional health is to give the kid a sense of inferiority. I can't do this stuff. I hate this stuff. This stuff is no, this stuff is no good. I won't do it. Right? And people can become convinced they can't do it. I showed some of my graduate students the research that has been done by many people since the end of the 19th century showing the development of artistic abilities and how all people really have the ability to be able to, for instance, draw a human form that looks more or less human. Not great, right? I showed them the theories. We went over it. I convinced maybe one person in all that time, the person happened to be a woman, that she could probably get better or not. All the rest said, I stink at this stuff. Doesn't matter what your theories show. I know I can't do it. Of course, because they were taught by people who didn't know anything about art. Do we have people who want to be art teachers? Yeah. A couple, right? I have three, right? So, and I already gave you that example of going from one illiterate teacher to another. The average elementary teacher doesn't know anything about art, and so you just keep going with people who don't know what to do. By the way, the average art teacher doesn't know too much about artistic development, but that's a different story, OK? I'll, uh, let me give you an example, OK? I'll tell you what I cried about. Let's go to this. When I would draw a person, I would draw a person like this, and then a neck, and then this, and then like this, and like that, arms, and like this, OK? I was the youngest kid in the grade, but at some point, right, let me see how you do this. Let me see how you do this. Come down like this. And then you get, there's a way you here. You go like this. And then you get here. That's how you get a crotch. OK, am I right? Yeah, let's get rid of this. OK, 
come down like this. I'm just trying to get a crotch here. How do you do that? I used to know how to do it here. There you go. And you have legs, okay? This is developmentally more advanced than this, okay? Feet, I never could get, okay? Now, the teacher would show me how to do this over and over. I'd watch her and I would copy, but if I looked away myself, and it was an art teacher, I came back to this. There's development in artistic ability, just like there's development in math and reading and understanding. Okay? So come back to me. So those of you who want to be art teachers, remember that too. If a kid can't do something, the kid's just not developmentally ready. Or you're jumping developmental steps. You should read Lowenfeld and Britain. Britain and Lowenfeld. You know that stuff? Lowenfeld and Britain stuff? Oh boy. That used to be required reading. Now it's just skills, 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 skills drills. If a kid can't do something, you're losing everything by drilling and drilling and drilling and getting more failure and more failure and more failure. If teaching a kid a subtask, and the kid can identify all the letters and still can't read the words, stop doing it. Doesn't mean that. The kid doesn't get the connection, the logical connection. If kids can count one, two, three, four, five, and still can't figure out that three plus two is five, or that if you have two things lined up in a row and you pull one apart and take it away, it doesn't have more, it has less. If you, if you have five pennies here and five pennies here and pull these out, let's say seven here and seven here, and stretch out the seven so that they'll take one off, so that the row with six is longer than the row with seven, the kid tells you it has more, you're wasting your time doing math. And more than that, drilling gives kids a sense of inferiority. I can't do this. I'm no good. My efforts come to nothing. Again, it's the, it's the same thing that we heard from the other social learning theorists about a sense, a sense of uh, 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 ex external locus of control. Even if I succeed, it has nothing to do with me. I'm inferior. I can't do this. Now the question of why two kids the same age, one can do this and the other one can't, that's almost irrelevant when you're a teacher, okay? The most important thing is what do I do now that the kid's in front of me? What am I going to do? Giving kids the sense of can do is extraordinarily important. And that's why people will say kids will sit in front of video games for hours playing them because they're successful. That they can do well. People gravitate to things which they can do well. Okay? And interestingly enough, the video games don't make demands on you. Whenever you sit down in a video game, you can't do it. You're terrible. But the video game doesn't say, you've got to get to level three by this date, we're giving you a test. Or you're going to be testing that, I'm not talking about, or a teacher test, you're going to get an F if you don't get to level five by, by in three weeks. You don't have that. You just play, you go at your own speed. And if you're not successful at this game, you go to another game. And it is, it is interesting. Did I tell you about Fast Eddie? There was a game called Fast Eddie. And I used to play it with a kid on a cartridge. You're too young to remember that. The old Sorry? Commodore. I, I Say it again. I had a VIC-20. A Commodore. Commodore VIC-20. Commodore VIC-20. Instead of this, they had a cartridge, and you'd stick it into the side, and up would pop the game. And I had one, one kid, he just loved to play Fast Eddie. And we would play Fast Eddie and do a little math or do whatever we were doing, a little more Fast Eddie. And, and this was not a, by the way, this was not a six-year-old. This was like a 16-year-old, right? And we 15. So we play a little and do a little algebra and this and that. And the kid had had a drug problem. So we were on and on. So, and then after he left the clinic, I had an, about an hour to go before I would see the next person. And I would play Fast Eddie the whole hour. One time the next person canceled, I played Fast Eddie for two hours. I became fascinated with Fast Eddie, tranced with it, enthralled with it, over and over and over. And I got up, finally I got to the last level, and I couldn't quite <laughs> conquer that level. If I remember the day I got to the end, it was, oh, I have it, right? Here I am, sit, you know, 
because, because I would get better and better and better at Fast Eddie. Okay? It was something I can do and do well. All right? Anybody watch poker on television? If you watch, there's a lot of luck in poker in case you're interested. You will see that the players who lose, and they interview them, right, the big names, they usually feel okay about themselves. Because the cards are the cards. One guy, he puts in all his money with a pair of aces, another guy calls him with a pair of tens, right? The last card's a ten, the guy with a pair of aces loses. He said, I played that right. They get down on themselves when they play wrong, when they feel that they didn't do what was right. Okay? You'll even see one time, that player who went in, he won the championship, by the way, the one with the tens. You can see he was a little embarrassed about the whole thing, right? Later, he knocked out the other two guys with good play. But it, it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's a sense of did I do well, did I do the right thing, right? I actually, there was a rerun of that. Someone called me and told me to watch it because it was a perfect demonstration of that. So ultimately, ultimately what we have is a sense that the purpose of schools is to give kids a sense of can do. That's the most important thing. And that's really your most important job as a teacher. And overcoming this sense of can't do is very difficult. Now, once again, Erickson does not have hints about cognition the way, for instance, Piaget does. But that he elaborates, perhaps better than anyone, the emotional price to be paid for failing. Okay? Has anyone have had anything that you couldn't do and then you tried it years later and you were stunned that you were pretty good at it? Sort of shocked you? Who wants to talk about it? You want to talk about it? Go ahead. You. Painting. Paint, painting, painting the bedroom or painting a picture? Painting ceramics. Okay, go ahead. What I have? Yeah. As a child, I, I had a real hard time in art class. I, I did stick figures. I used to cry figures. in art class. Stick figures. Yeah. And then as an adult, when I calmed down, I was able to. Right. When I calmed down, notice that? The tension, the upset in it. Right? There are people, particularly boys, adult males who will tell you that they're awful in sports. And they're not. They just, when they were in school, it happened. I, it happened. I'll tell you, I was one of them. I was the youngest kid in my class, reached puberty late. I was awful in sports. So one day between high school and college, I took a, a year's trip to Israel, work study program. There were a bunch of us. And we lived on a kibbutz, it's a communal settlement, and the members challenged us to play softball. Unbeknownst to us, they were in the best, the second best softball team in the country. They always got to the finals and got beaten by the, the U.S. Embassy Marine team. Right? That's what people beat them, man. <laughs> you know, it was a bunch of 19 to 20 year old Americans who would beat them. But they, there were several Americans on the team. People come to live in Israel from America, and they had taught other people, and they were a great softball team. So they were beating us like about 300 to 2 or something. I don't remember. Finally, they kept knocking up pitch. And finally, somebody said, Lieberman, you pitch. I said, I can't pitch. I can't play this game. I struck out their best hitter with some sloppy stuff that a friend of mine had shown me when we were kids, right? You know, twisties and turnies. I was okay. It was stunned me. This was the year after high school, but it turned out that there were some kids who'd gone to high school in states where you could go younger, and I wasn't the youngest one anymore. It stunned me that I was average. I was not a bad athlete. In college, you had to take phys ed in the old days, right? Took phys ed. I was all right. I was no better or worse than anyone else, right? I wasn't the best. I wasn't the worst. It shocked me because I had this sense of inferiority. To this day, I... Right. If you ask me if I'm a good athlete, I said, Pfft. okay, now I'm too old to play, but, you know, and, and it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. If you have your own kids, okay, don't tell them, Henry, everything you touch turns to shit. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. 
It's a life destroyer. It's a life destroyer. And in schools, you have to be very, 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 two more, very, very careful not to give off signals of frustration or upset. To praise progress, to tell kids, you're your own kid. Do it at your own speed. Kids are going to be self-evaluating anyway, telling them not to worry about things, okay? Telling them that they can move forward, they have progress, and to give, and this is, of course, is what Vygotsky is telling you with his own approximal development, to give tasks that are achievable and accomplishable, okay? And to give sick kids a good sense of can-do and to promote those things that kids do well. Sometimes it's difficult. They used to have a rule. Do they still have it? No pass, no play? Right? I think they still have that rule. My guess is they'll still have it even if this tape runs several years. No pass, no play. If you don't pass, if you're the outstanding athlete on the team, then you, then you, and you don't pass your classes, you can't play. I would like to see a rule, no pass, no math. If you can't pass a football at least 25 yards to the receiver, you can't take math class. I don't get it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that was like for every high school activity. Like you couldn't participate in clubs. You couldn't right. do anything in That's high right. school. That's right. Exactly. So in other words, you're great at this, but you can't do it because you didn't pass. I don't get it. Why? I don't get it. Explain that to me. You have to explain that to me. You can't participate in the things that you like and do well because you can't pass the classes. Why don't we do it the other way around? No pass, no math. If, you can't, if you're not a good athlete, you can't take math and English. I don't get it. What's the difference? No picture, no lecture. If you can't draw a good picture, you can't go to the classes. I don't get it. If you go on to college, there are a lot of majors. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of a football major. You haven't heard of a phys ed major? Phys ed, yeah. You can major in phys ed, but that's math. That's a lot of kinesiology you got all kinds right. of things it, it, to tie into it but right. it becomes a good question about what's your core I mean obviously that's what this that's the schools are saying but I, I'm not saying don't tell the kid you don't have to do math but the question because if you have some place where a kid excels and does well why should you cut that off just as easy you could say you want to stay on the team you got to have math tutoring so it becomes it becomes an interesting kind of thing of course there's, there's tremendous pressure, right? So once, we have a, a person on the faculty whose father was a, a professor, and, and he had somebody taking the course, and he was failing the course. He said, come to him. I desperately need him on my team, right? I desperately need him. Pass him. So he said back to him, I have a guy who desperately needs to excel in, in, in sports. Said, Make him your shortstop. Right? Make up your short stuff. And then, okay, so it's a tough one, but it's something that inside the context of the class, you need to find things that kids do well. Right? One of the biggest failures of our schools is that they reward the same people over and over and over again. They make most people feel, eh. They give some people a tremendous sense of industry and the rest a sense of, eh. So now all of you are in college, so you did, must have done OK in high school or overcome in community college. It's interesting enough that community colleges often see this as one of their big tasks, to take people who think they can't do it and to show them that they can. So it becomes, it becomes a very uh, a difficult a difficult problem, and you yourself in your, in your classrooms need to, let me give you an example. I know one teacher, she has a literary journal, and every kid has a job. The kids who can't, she, she said one year she lucks out, you often, and the kids who can't write well, they can draw well, right? So they become the front page, they, they draw the pictures, she has editors, I've told you about this before, find something that every kid can do. 
And if it's something that embarrasses and humiliates a kid, stop doing it. Certainly not in public. Don't do it in public. Don't set kids up to the board to do something when you know they can't. Now, unfortunately, a lot of you are going to have 150 kids. It's going to be hard to work one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. But you'll notice that they have these commercials for the Sylvan Learning Center. The one that's running now as I broadcast this class is a little girl who gives an answer in public to something she's asked at the zoo. Right, about how much food to feed somebody, the fish or something. Wow, look how good I am. Wow, I never would talk up before. And they've tapped into something. Okay, they've tapped into something. That the parents are worried about the kid's self-image, a sense of industry versus inferiority. All right, let me get off that soapbox. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. And here we have the next one, which is identity versus role confusion. This, of course, this parallels Freud's, let me see if I can get to Freud here, right, genital stage. And you'll remember that Freud talked a lot about kids looking for roles, getting their own independent roles, about who they were, okay, when, oops, sorry. Let me put this. About, about who they were when they, uh, wait a second, now I messed everything up. And of course the age is 12 to 18. And we talked a lot about what, what Freud had said about finding identity and, and role confusion about kids. Remember I told you, come back to me if you can, about kids Coming in one day, want to be a missionary, the next day want to make a million dollars, and the next day want to be a rock singer, etc. Okay, this is a sense of who I am, what I am, what's my role in life. Getting an identity of the kind of person I am. By the way, the mental illness that we get from a, a poor resolution of industry versus inferiority is obvious. P people with inferiority complexes, people who won't try. This is Erickson's explanation about guilt, about not wanting to be competitive, because I know I'm going to lose anyway, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Erickson says, ultimately, you have to get a sense of who you are. He often talked about it in terms of jobs and roles in life, but not only that. Okay. He talked about people taking identity, for instance, from a sense of family. One of the interesting things talked, to, talked about, he, he would talk about, and Eric Sonis would talk about, someone whose idea was to get married, and get married, have children, and raise her family. And her identity was being Mrs. You know, John Jones. If your last name's Jones, I'm sorry, right? Then something happens, she gets divorced. And she's lost, who is she? Okay? Later, Erickson is going to explain empty nest syndrome like this, okay? My, part of my identity is being a parent. Now my kids grow up, now what? Okay, and often, often, some people say this is a, con this is a source of conflict between parents and grandchildren. Okay. Oh, there's another one, here's a grandchild. Right now, I can do it all over again. This has to do with generativity, too. My thing is a child raiser, right? My identity as a grandparent. You've got to be careful what that grandparent identity is because some stuff is none of your business. You're not the kid's parent, right? Very annoying, right? <laughs> if that happens to you, just say to your parents when you're raising your own kids, Remember how annoyed you got when your parents butted in how you raised me, right? So, so but this is part of having an identity of who you are and what you are and what kind of person you are. And there are, there are other ways to have an identity other, other than, other than uh, through uh, jobs. Identity of what kind of person you are. Religion or social movement, this is what, if you remember, Freud talked about how people at this age often identify in their early 20s. And, and Eric's is the one who pointed out that we've extended adolescence beyond Freud, okay? How many people here, think about it at home if you're there too, how many people here just knew from the time you were a kid you were going to college? Who knew that? 
okay? We got about half the class, okay? Well, basically, your adolescence was extended until you graduated from college. You weren't making any decisions on your own. You weren't assuming an adult identity. You were just going to college. And in college, it began to get to you. Well, what do you want to major in? Uh-oh. I've got to start making some adult decisions. And often people who just know go through several majors. Anybody here go through several majors? Yeah, there you go. But after people who raise their hand, I don't know. Tells them my son went through six. Okay, he loves what he does now. He loves it. He's in emergency management, all this kind of stuff. I told you about the poison gas cloud, didn't I? The poison gas cloud? He, he went to a convention, the way he got his first job, or second job in emergency management, actually, his first job in emergency management, was they had a convention and they had this wonderful evacuation plan for uh, getting people out of a factory that, had, that made noxious gas and right, made chemicals. And there was an explosion and, and all of a sudden this poison gas was coming out and they had this wonderful evacuation out of the factory. But his specialty was transportation. So he showed, and they had the factory laid out all dimensions, how everybody got beautifully out of the factory and they all died in the traffic jam on the roads as the cloud <laughs> came drifting over and killed them all, right? So you gotta pray the wind's blowing the other way, right? So, so he, somebody said, mm, this, this guy's got something, right? <laughs> this human, so that, that kind of thing. But it took him a long time, first into transportation, and he liked that too much, then transportation emergency, oh, that he liked. That he really liked, okay? And the first job he got, I'm not going to tell you who he worked for, but you pay your taxes to them, and there are a lot of traffic jams, right? He said, there's just not a sense of getting something done. We'll get to it when we get to generativity. But who am I, and what am I, what am I going to do? Often this has to do with searching out a, a, a religious organization. So that's why some people come at this age, and they're, you know, I'm a sense of where do I fit in a group when I'm religious. And you'll notice, let's go back to PowerPoint for one second. This is peers and other groups. This is where you find who you are as a person with your peers and with groups. This is where religion comes from. This is where our idealistic causes come from. Once again, I'm not supposed to date this, but we have, as we're talking about this, we have, come back to me if you can, we have some marches going on about a social issue. It's mostly young people. Not completely, but mostly, or a lot, young people. Okay, who am I? Where do I fit in life? What's my place in the world? Often rebellions. Okay, against the church in which you were raised or against the, the way that you were meant to go. One of the interesting things is that um, it's probably not a big secret that uh, many campuses are overwhelmed by left-wing politics. Okay, and uh, two of my four kids, maybe three of them, okay, uh, got so turned off by hearing this constant barrage of left-wing politics that they... they went the other way. I wouldn't say they're, they're ultra, ultra right-wingers, but their idea was, I don't listen to anybody who's barraging me with all this stuff. I gotta think about myself. I'm, I'm sick of this stuff. So I don't wanna hear it anymore. It was part of their rebellion against being told the way to think or to do things. Gives me hope for campuses. <laughs> That's, you know, we'll be able to get differing opinions. But in any case, you have to be careful about this. All of a sudden, the nicest, sweetest kids, right, are going to are going to rebel against who they were and what they were and where they were, right? Okay, uh, um, this sense of identity gives you a sense of who I am as a person, where my values are, where I lie, what it means. And you'll often find people who were, right, you'll often find people who identified with certain kinds of groups. One of the, for instance, David Horowitz was an, uh, in the 1960s was an extreme left-wing radical. Right now, he, is, he, he despises the left, right? And he often goes in debates against the left-wingers because he, his, he felt that his, and he, his, you know, he was looking for a sense of identity, and then he, it, it came down someplace else, right? And he, often, he felt that you know, he, it was, it was, he wasn't allowed to develop a proper identity. That's an Ericksonian analysis. He won't tell you that way. He'll tell you he just thought it through. But these are the kinds of, these are the kinds of issues that come here, and these are the kinds of places that can often lead to a depression. Who am I? What am I? What am I trying to do? Acceptance by peers is extremely important. Finding a place where I fit and I know where I am.
That's another reason why I'm so upset about kids being cut off from activities which they like. Okay, I may not be too smart to be that, but I'm a good baseball player, or I excel in the science club, or I'm okay in the chess club, whatever. Okay? Now, Erickson is going to tell you that a healthy identity will get you out into the world and into society. Okay? What Okay, and what, what happens, and, and ultimately you find a way where you can fit in a socially productive way. Right? These are teenagers looking for who they are and what they are. Let me repeat again, the depressions that come here and the suicide. You've got to report it. I've said that before with Freud. I'm telling you again. Okay, if kids say they're going to commit suicide, you've got, you've got to report it. If they come to you for help, you can be their friend. Okay? If they come to you and tell you, if they can come to you and you have to show them, if they come to you because they're doing well in your class or well in something that you do, you need to be supportive. If they're doing poorly, you need to remind them there are other things in which they, do, in which they can do things well. Not having a peer group is extremely difficult. Everyone has noticed, we're going to get to Kohlberg, everyone has noticed that not having a peer is devastating, a peer group for these kids. Where do I fit? What's my identity? Who am I? Stand alone, be your own person. You can't tell that to kids this age. I've got to fit somewhere. I have to be a part of something. Hopefully, they'll be a part of something positive. Often, kids become a part of something negative. Okay, we'll talk that more, about that when we get to Kohlberg, but they, right? I, I can do something well. I, I'm a part of this group that sells drugs. I'm a part of this group who's whose sense of identity is rebelling against the system. Mm -hmm. okay, we'll get that when we talk to Kohlberg. I'll give you some more examples of that. Okay, next. Okay, let's go to the PowerPoint. Erickson talks about intimacy versus isolation, and this is... This is what he calls in the 20s, okay? As I said, this identity versus role confusion will often last into the 20s, and this one go into the 20s and into the 30s, right? Let me tell you one more story about identity versus role confusion. Come back to me for a second. My daughter, she won't mind my talking about it, from the time she was a little kid, wanted to be a nurse. But, but she didn't go to nursing school, and said she went, she went to college, she majored in anthropology, then she went uh, overseas for a year, and she said, well, maybe I'll get into some aspect of health education. So she writes a letter here at U of H, and the guy offers her a job, because health education is done through HHP, and most of the, many of the people there are not. She was, she was a, a, a social science major, and the person who was a chair at the time said, oh, boy. He said, I get a social science. So he, he offered her a job on the spot if she would come and enroll. And she got her degree in that, and she went and she actually taught at a community college for a while. And then she was actually teaching in Brooklyn, and then 9-11 came, and there was no money in New York. And so she was low on the totem pole from the point of being rehired. So she said, you know what, I'm going to come back to nursing and go to nursing school. Right now she's a nurse, and she loves it. She came back to who she was. She was always more or less in this health thing for her senior project. In anthropology, she did her senior project on teenage male prostitutes and AIDS and not having AIDS. By the way, it's amazing, you know, they, they, she found out that most of them hope that they test positive for AIDS. Why? It's a good question, why? Because if they did, then all the social services would set in, right? They, could go, they would be sent to the hospital and they'd get food and they'd get a place to sleep and they would get into their, the whole AIDS network would say this way, they were on the street being, being uh, you know, exploited by the Men who came by from, you know, prostitution, they, 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 she said they, they couldn't worry about they're going to die eventually. They thought they were going to die every day their lives were in danger. So it was unbelievable the things she found out. So that's the kind of thing she was into. And then she, she did the first job she got was interviewing homeless people. It was, right, and finding out where they were. But ultimately she wanted to be in that area. And ultimately it took her, and she was in her late 20s, or I don't know, that's okay. Well, she became, okay, a little older before she became a nurse. Okay? She finally found that idea, and I think that's where she really wants to be. We'll see if she wants to get back into health education, but that's, 
Those are kind of things. So it takes a little longer in our society. It's not surprising, right? It's not surprising that adolescence lasts a long time. And, you know, the age of marriage keeps going up and up. And so that's, you know, as people are looking for who am I and what am I. Okay, intimacy versus isolation. Let's go back to the PowerPoint if we can for a second. This talks about the significant others being partners, finding partners in life. This means friends, sex, competition, and cooperation. Okay? Having a sense of intimacy around sex. Okay, you'll notice that Freud, when he talked about the Oedipal stage, how some, how some people are incapable of being intimate with sex. By the way, we didn't talk about women. We have women who are the same way, too. Less than men, right? Finding friends, a sense of intimacy with friends. Competition, knowing how to compete properly, and knowing how to cooperate. There's good competition, there's bad competition, okay? This is a, a way to find people. Now, you'll notice, if you don't have a sense of identity of who you are, right? If you don't trust anyone, if you have a, if you don't know exact, if you have a sense of constant inferiority, that you have nothing to contribute to other people, it's often, it's going to be very difficult to have a sense of intimacy with other people. Okay? A true partnership. Okay? Come back to me for a second. How many people made, how many people, well, you're, some of you are, how many people have friends who were your friends when you were kids who are still your best friends? A lot. That's good. That's good. Okay? A lot of people, I don't have too many. Okay? A lot of people pick up good friends along the way as they have a sense of intimacy and isolation. But you'll notice that the nature of your friendship is very different from what it was when you were 14. Okay, you managed to grow together. This sense of intimacy, of course, Erickson says, is at the basis of a healthy marriage, at the basis of positive sexual relationships. Okay, it's at the basis of good friendships. It's the base of good competition. Competition, right, there's healthy competition and unhealthy competition. Healthy, com unhealthy competition is, if I step on your, if I knock you two steps down the ladder, I'll look like I'm higher. If I step on your face, I get you out of the way. Okay, I can cheat, doesn't matter, I can lie and I can struggle, right? Healthy competition, for instance, I play poker with two guys who sell insurance. One of them is an old friend of mine and I buy insurance from him, the other one gives, the other one, before we got a regular place, he used to drive me to poker games. He would give me advice. And he said, I know you're not going to buy from me, but you should ask the other guy about this, the other guy about that. They didn't hate each other. As a matter of fact, once I was thinking about getting a certain kind of insurance, the guy said to me, why don't you ask the other one? He knows more about it than I do. It was healthy competition. Okay, we're in this together. We're not, we're not, right? We're not to compete. Sports is an analogy for that, right? There's healthy competition, there's unhealthy competition. I'll cheat and I'll lie and I'll try to go against the rules, et cetera, et cetera. I'll play according to the rules and we'll see who really is better. And of course, there's ultimately there's cooperation. I want to tell you something very interesting about cooperation and competition. Companies that foster an aura of cooperation among their employees are far more competitive against other companies than ones that foster internal ideas of we're competing with each other, right? If you don't do well, then the person next to you is going to knock you out. Compete with each other, step on each other's throats, right? Companies that say encourage their employees to steal clients from each other are not the successful companies. The ones that encourage employees to cooperate with each other are successful companies. And those companies, in turn, don't cheat when they compete with others. Right? They tend not to. There's a competitive spirit, one in which we're competitive, but internally there's cooperation. A sense of knowing how to work with and compete with other people. Obviously, you cannot do that if you don't trust other people. Right? You see, trust versus mistrust is at the base of a healthy personality. The humanists are going to tell us that, too. Okay? Having friends who are there. When I was a kid, I think those days may be gone, we used to have a term called car buddy. Everybody had one car, right? It was rare was the family that had two cars. Rare was the family. They were expensive, right? Came from working class neighborhood, right? I grew up working class, you know, middle management and lower, okay? 
that kind of stuff, was he couldn't afford two cars. So, and in those days still, by and large, the men did most of the working. My mother had a part-time job in the afternoon, so my father was in a carpool, he'd pay for the gas, the other people would take turns driving, and then my mother would drive to her job in the afternoon, right? So, the, but, and when you got old enough to drive, the question was, your father gonna let you take the car or not? So we often had, right, friends, oh, this, this guy's my car buddy. I'm his friend because his father lets him take the car and he can drive. We were 16, 17, right? Man, I really needed him. I was the youngest kid. I learned to, <laughs> in my class, I learned to drive later than anybody else. So, you know, those kinds of things. It's not a real friend. It's not real friendship. It's, explo it's, it's exploiting people for what you need. Now, real, a, a, a real sense of intimacy is, is mutual. Okay, people who don't get that live in isolation. They live in isolation. Okay, here, let's go back to the PowerPoint for one second. Intimacy for isolation. Okay, see this? And we have, let me see if I can get, does anybody know? Let's go to the, um, the, ta the tablet. The, the sociologists have a term for this. People who, can't, who don't work with other people, they call it alienation. Does anybody know what psychologists call it? This is called a schizoid personality. People who just cannot, people who just don't uh, get along with others. They're isolated. They can't establish decent relations. Ultimately, an extreme schizoid personality is just off alone. A hermit, so to speak. Okay? It's a sense of alienation from society, from other people, having no one to whom to turn. Right? And let me say once again, let's go back to the PowerPoint that all of these things, a sense of initiative, a sense of industry are necessary for this. It shouldn't surprise you that the person, that, that the example I gave you of the person who I, I met years later, that his, he had been through two or three marriages and he couldn't get things right, right? That's part of it, not being able to develop true intimacy, okay? Now, some people, come back to me, some people, okay, Intimacy doesn't have to be through a marriage, right? If you talk, they, there was a program on about uh, uh, truly successful monasteries, for instance, or uh, used to call it a nunnery. Where do nuns say convents? Convents. The nuns themselves have a good sense of intimacy with one another. They trust each other. They support each other. They have a sense of friendly competition, but they cooperate when it's necessary. Right? Healthy ones, they'll often have, they, they had one on TV I saw a few years ago where they would play games with each other. And they were fiercely competitive about who's going to win these games, and they were mind games. Right? On the other hand, when it came to real things, they competed. Of course, they didn't cheat. <laughs> because part of it was to say, you know, let's try to help each other get better at these mind games. Okay, the next stage that Erickson talks about is, let's go back to the PowerPoint. He calls it generativity versus stagnation. Generativity means accomplishing something important for society. When he first brought this out, it was raising children. That's what generativity meant, raising children. Okay? Um, but he was criticized almost from the beginning. He said, well, what about teaching orders of nuns, people said to him. They're not generative. Okay, they don't do things that are important. So he backed down on this. So he said, once you know who you are, once you're able to engage in meaningful activities with other people, then you need to have a sense I'm doing something important for the future. Come back to me again. Okay, something that's important that means something. And eventually he expanded this beyond the idea of raising children, although raising children was very generative, right? Doing something that's important in the world that makes a difference. Okay? And often people will find their sense of identity in something generative outside the mainstream. People who spend their life being scout leaders. Right? That's what they love to do. Right? Or coaching in the Little League. That's what they love to do if they do it in a decent way. Right now, right. 
turns out, by the way, that a lot of the troubles with the first competi competition in the Little League's winning above all often comes from the parents, not from the kids or from the coach, right? So, and that's generative, helping kids, helping the next generation. Leaving something important to society in general is what I'm doing important. One day, I was in my program, we had a substitute, and the guy, we were talking, and the guy, it turns out, what he did for a living was he rented videos. I I can say this nicely. If you have a small video store, and you're trying to compete with Blockbuster or some of the other big ones, you're not competing with them by renting out Fun with Dick and Jane, right? Or the last, you're right. You're competing with them. You all know how, right? With porno, right? I'll just tell you, right? He said 70% of my business is porno. He said, and it bothered him. And we were talking and talking. It turns out he said, look, I had three kids' stories. I think he had three kids. And he did this to make a living. Got into the business, make a living, supported his kids, et cetera, et cetera. This is what he did. He didn't care what he was doing for a living. He was found something. He had a few businesses. This one went. Well, now he basically said, he didn't say it quite this harshly, but he basically said, my kids are grown up. They're all earning their own livings, and I'm selling porno. I'm renting porno. This is not what I want to do with my life, right? It was very upsetting to him. Okay? So, you know, I have to be doing something important, something that I feel is meaningful for society. This, okay, ultimately, this becomes an important thing. This, says Erickson, is the midlife crisis. Am I doing anything that's important? What am I doing now? I have 20 years left, 15 years left, I have to do something important. This is the empty nest syndrome. I've spent my life raising my children, now what? And by the way, generativity can, can if your identity is shattered, Generativity can really be brutal, okay? All of a sudden, my whole identity was being part of this marriage. The marriage broke up. I don't know what to do with myself. Right? That can happen to men, too, by the way, not only to women, obviously. Okay? I'll never forget the time that somebody identified me as I told you, my oldest son's name is Avi, as Avi's father, right? I'm in a school. I just given them, the two years before, I'd given them a talk. It was Dr. Lieberman, you know? And I had such a good feeling, right? That's who I was. I didn't care about all those titles. I was his father. It was so good, right? I mean, a, a huge part of my generativity, my gener was, uh, an identity, was being a father to those kids. I was a single parent with custody for a while. I was just immersed in it. It was so important to me, right? And then they grew up, right? Now what? Now who are you? Now what are you going to do? What's going to be, right? I remember, oh, as long as we're doing therapy, what the heck. When I got married, my wife had two kids whose father had passed away when they were teeny kids. Oh, it was such a good feeling. I have two more kids to raise. It was so wonderful, you know? I just loved it. Clearly, that was where my, one of my sense of generativity came from. Then it became difficult for me. Okay? Fortunately, I enjoy the teaching. I think that's important. But I'll tell you, I've, I've become re-involved in, 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 in my religion and in religious education last few years. Because it's got to be something important. Now, you're doing something important. Does it mean anything? Okay? It's, it's, and it's really important. Successful armies. For all the pooing and the humming and the fooing we do about armies, they convince the soldiers they're doing something important. Right? This is one way that, that cults work and other things work. You're doing something important. And everyone needs to feel I'm doing something important, that I'm generative, that I'm leaving doing something important 
for, and its generativity usually means for the next generation. I'll leave behind a mark in the world that will make a difference, right? Raising my children or whatever. Some people are generative in other ways. It doesn't have to be children, right? It's art, it's music, it's, just, it's something that I've left behind, something that makes a difference, okay? And this can change. You notice this is a long time. This is, let's, let's go back to the PowerPoint for a while. First of all, this goes, this is adulthood from the 20s till old age. You know, there's a sense, most of this goes around, the, the words that I have here are around Erickson's initial sense of what was going on here, uh, of, of raising children. There's divided labor, divided labor with a spouse, okay, in, 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 in raising children, shared household, okay? But it goes well beyond that. Come back to me. If you can. It, goes, it goes to the whole idea of doing something important in life. And finding one's way in life. And often when you find your identity, I told you my son's first job, he knew what he wanted to do. He knew he wanted to be in transportation. And transportation makes things better. It does. Okay, it's important. But he had a job and he said, what I'm doing is just not very important. My wife goes, oh, you're working for the state, you have money, you have, you have this. He said, I can't do it anymore. I just can't do it anymore. You know, I, I, you know it, it was tough. Quit the job, go to graduate school. Not know what your job was gonna be. My wife was nervous about it, right? What's he gonna do? He's, got, he's steady, it's solid, it's okay here. But he said, I'm not doing anything important. I have good ideas and they can't come to fruition. They get caught in the bureaucracy, etc. He still has frustrations like that. Now he's working for another bureaucracy. Now he's working for the city of Washington. But he feels that he's doing things that are important, that he can make progress, that they're listening to him. Of course, a little higher up in the bureaucracy now, but those are the kinds of things th that are important that you, you need to, this is teacher burnout. I save that for last. I, I'm not doing anything anymore. It doesn't mean anything to me. This is one of the reasons that I am so frustrated by this attempt to run schools from the top down. Don't think, don't do anything, don't use your own imagination, don't use your own skills, just do what I tell you. How can you expect a teacher to function like that? A teacher ought to be able to say, you know, I got an instinct. This book's going to really turn this kid on to reading. This is the book that that kid's going to read. Or this is a great book for these kids. Never mind what the curriculum says. Let's do this book instead of the other one. That's generative. That means something. Try to do it. I know you run into all kinds of bureaucratic mess and try to do it. But try to do it. Finally, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Erickson talks about old age, okay? Integrity versus despair. By the way, old age is being pushed back and back already. You know, how old are you when you're old? Does anybody know why 65 was set as the age for retirement for Social Security initially? Go ahead, push it down. People were dying at 66. Yeah, every, <laughs> no, people were dying at 64, right? Just about everybody was dead at 65. Right? You just were taking care of the few old people who happened to make it. Then you could keep it that way because of the baby boom. There were more and more, you know, for every generation, they, they were kept to have kids, so there were more and more people. Now that the baby boom's over, the retirement age is being pushed up. We can't afford it, right? And people don't feel particularly old in their 60s, right? A lot of people work well into their 70s, right? You, know, you don't feel too old. So, but the idea here is, whoops. Let's go back here for a second. There's a sense of integrity versus despair. When you really do feel have old age, right? Come back to me now. You're, you're looking back. You're looking back on your life. It's too late to do anything about it. Okay? Let's, let's, I'm sorry. Let's go back to here. I'm sorry. You'll notice now that the significant others is all of humankind. Did I make a contribution to the world? 
And when you have this sense of integrity, I know this is beyond what you're going to do, but let me just say now that Erickson says we're all dealing with all these stages at the same time, right? Part of generativity is also integrity. I'm doing this stupid job, right? Can I look back and say I accomplished something? When people look back and say I didn't accomplish anything, in this stage they say I got to move on. Here it's too late to move on. That I contribute something to humanity, okay? And if your answer is no, you get depressed. I messed up. Okay, come back to me. My, okay, people look back and they say, what did I do with my life? I'll tell you a little story about my father. My father was on the team that invented Code of Color. As a matter of fact, one of the problems with Code of Color, you read the history of Code of Color, you see my father's name in there. One of the problems with Code of Color is they invented this, this was the first time that they actually had film, not on glass plates, but on plastic, you can turn, it was a big deal. Right, color film, it was a big deal. They couldn't get the emulsion, the chemical, to stick to the plastic. What happens, some uh, 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 a theoretical chemist invents the stuff, then they give it to working photographers to see if it can work. My father claims the other guy, and they couldn't get it to work, broke the flask, and he noticed that the emulsion was sticking to it. The emulsion is the stuff on the film, right? The other guy claims my father broke the glass and the beaker, and, you know, or the, whatever they broke, and he noticed. In any case, they noticed together, right? They ground up glass, and they figured out how to get, and for a long time there was ground up glass in coat of color. They figured out how to get it to stick to the film, right? My father, my father was on the team of three or four photographers who developed the first pictures from the top of Mount Everest. Right, when Hillary went up there with Tenzing, his guide, right, he took films that were gonna be shown to the queen. They send them back to Kodak and they said, get your best photographers. In the old days, my father could take one negative and make two pictures out of it. You had to look twice to realize it was the same negative. Developing film was a real art. And you can get the effects and what did it look like and what, it was, what was going on, right? So they wanted to, and they got their best photographer. He was gone, I never didn't see him for three years. 18 hours a day he was gone to develop this in time for the queen. To get the best look, to make the pictures the most beautiful, right? He was on that team, right? He, did, you know. he got depressed when he got old. He did something. And he told me afterwards, he recovered. He said to me, the therapist said to me, look, you're on the team that did color color. And he said, you don't think there would be color film if I, had, if I didn't do that? He said, so somebody else would have developed the pictures from Mount Everest. So what? Right? I wasn't the only great photographer there, so they would have found another one if I got sick. Right? You think there were only four photographers employed by Kodak? I mean, it was an honor to be picked. It was an honor. They you know there were there were dozens that they could have they could have picked on the research team. They had a lot of working photographers here. They picked him. He said it finally happened when they said, "What about your sons?" Nobody else raised your sons except you, right? You and your <laughs> their mother. Daddy had to concede. That was real generativity. Daddy looked back and he had done something in his life. My brother and I were okay guys, right? <laughs> so. He said, that's, that's good. And he said, that snapped me out of it. Okay, he told me later. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, oh, three days and it was done. But it took a while. But ultimately, you look back, did I, make, did I do something? Was it the way it had to be? Nobody looks back and said I didn't make any mistakes. Right? Believe me, if you think you've made mistakes now, just wait another 20 years. You'll make a lot more. People make a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. But in the end, you look back and say, there was a sense of integrity to my life. I did okay. I accomplished important things. I left something behind. My children, my work, okay? What I did, okay? My relationships with others. Those are important. Leaving behind good feelings is important. Helping other people is important. Okay. The things I did. So Erickson's going to tell us, let's go back to the, unlike Freud, that we're, to the, that we're all nuts. At each stage, there's an ideal achievement, okay? This is what a healthy personality looks like. Whoops, we better put something up there, right? Okay. In trust versus mistrust, there's a sense of hope. 
If you have a sense of mistrust, you don't feel hopeful that things are going to happen. If you're trusting, you have hope that even though you're hungry, the future will be okay. It'll take care of you. Things can get better. The ideal achievement, the perfect, the ideal resolution, oops, the ideal resolution of autonomy versus shame is willpower. I'm autonomous. I don't have to do, I can control myself. Remember, this is Freud's toilet training. I can control myself. I can do things so that I'm not, I don't feel ashamed. Wrong button. Let's try another. Let's try this one. This is not, I can't just try it. The perp initiative versus guilt, the ideal achievement is purpose. I have a purpose in life. Right? I have initiative. I have a purpose. There are things I want to do. Industry versus inferiority. I have a purpose and I have a sense of competence that I can achieve it. This is the exact same word that Piaget used. And I'm telling you, they came to this term independent. This is actually not Piaget's word. This is Piagetians who came later. A sense of competence, which comes out of a sense of industry. Identity versus role confusion, a sense of fidelity. And that's fidelity to self. I know who I am. I am what I am. I'm not ashamed of what I am. I know what my role in life is. I'm the person I was meant to be, and I'm, it's okay to be that person. Intimacy versus isolation, a sense of love. You have to be careful about love. One of the, well, I'll tell you, he won't mind. John Gay and I have been working together for a long time at this university. And he had a heart attack a few years ago. Came and told me about it. It was stunning to me, right? Only two people are allowed to go to the hospital, so be in the hospital. So two other people ran down there, right? Only two friends. And I was off the list. Okay, they, ran, they were there the day he got sick. They heard about it the day before I did. So I called him up. And of course, nobody was home, but I left a message for him and his wife. I said, there's, there's nothing, I know there's nothing I can do. Right? He's fine now, by the way, in operation. He's fine. There's, I know there's nothing I can do, but you know that I love you. If there's something I can do, let me know. I never used that word before. It didn't occur to me. But we've been friends for a long time. We worked together for a long time. And even after we drifted separate ways in our, in our academic work, we, we haven't published together in many, many years, there was still a sense of being able to trust each other. Even when we disagreed, it was always with a sense of respect for the other. There's a kind of love there. I don't love him the way I love my wife. I don't love him the way I love my kids. But there's a real sense of love there. Okay? If you have a clergyman you've been with, a clergy person, someone in the clergy, that can develop a sense of love for that person, even though there's a certain kind of this that's different from something else. Okay? Love for a friend, they're different. So, and it's the ability to have a personality that can love different people in different ways. Okay, the, po most, the positive outcome of genera generativity versus stagnation, of course, is care. I care about the world, I care about others. I care about making an achievement, making achievement. And finally, integrity versus despair, the final thing is wisdom and inner peace. I respect, you know, this respect for the wisdom of the elderly, a sense of, look, by the way, you're going to see this is very close to Eric's, to, to Maslow's um, uh, self-actualizing. I am who I am. Go ahead, have a, have a question? Um, I'm kind of confused on initiative versus guilt and it being purpose, because if they're only 30, three to six years old, I almost feel like purpose doesn't quite go with initiative, and I need that explained a little bit better. Well, the point is that I'm ready to go out and try things in the world. I'm ready to go out and try things. That's what initiative versus guilt. Remember, the kids are exploring and doing. I'm ready to go out. These things, look, the key here is that these things are always in all of our personalities. An adult personality, remember, has all of these well done. With initiative, I have a sense that I can go out and try things, that I have a reason to go out and do things. Okay? And we have to remember that all kids, all people are at all these stages all the time. The ages that are identified as when they are the most salient. That's the, in your personality, the thing that you're dealing with the most. But we're always looking back. There always has to be a sense of love, a sense of caring. 
They're always, we always need to be giving a kids a sense of competence and purpose. We always need to be able to tell kids, go explore and see what happens. And if you fail, it's all right. We always have to have a sense of developing who we are and what we are. I'm not sure that this sense of developing self ever ends. Okay, and we always are ultimately, ultimately, we're always caring. This wisdom and inner peace, I'm a lot older than, than almost all of you. So I think this comes later in life. But in the end, it's always still there, looking back and seeing who we are and what we are. And in the end, this is something that tells us people are always developing, that mental health is always there as an object. And it is indeed possible to be a mentally healthy individual. It is indeed, we are not full of these roiling, broiling hates and upsets only. We also can resolve a way to be, uh, uh, to be mentally healthy and to be creative and purposeful in the world. And that is really the job of education. That is really what we need to do and a therapy for that matter, to have people have a sense of self in the world. Okay, next time we're going to start probably on Coburg because of uh, religious reasons. I'll explain that to you uh, next class.